Renewed Israeli bombardment of Gaza after the ceasefire ended is worsening the humanitarian crisis. The US wants Israel to do more to protect Palestinian civilians. What's the military's strategy? And can Israel learn from the intelligence failures that led to Hamas's October attack? This is Inside Story. Hello there and a warm welcome to the program. I'm Jonah Hull. Israel has one of the most advanced and well-equipped militaries in the world. And yet, on October the 7th, Hamas fighters breached the Gaza border fence, infiltrated southern Israel and killed more than 1,100 people. Israel responded by declaring war on Hamas. Its bombing campaign has raised much of the Gaza Strip to the ground and killed more than 15,000 Palestinians. Many in the international community have condemned the offensive as disproportionate. After a brief ceasefire, the bombardment has resumed and appears to be expanding into the densely populated southern part of the Gaza Strip. What is the Israeli military's end game? A year ago, senior government officials reportedly dismissed intelligence pointing to an impending attack by Hamas. So who will be held accountable for the unheeded warnings? And what will it take for the Israeli government to call its operation in Gaza a success? We'll delve into all this in a moment, but first, this report from Fintan Monaghan. The attack by Hamas on southern Israel on October the 7th killed more than 1,100 people. It's widely seen as a major failure of Israeli intelligence. A report in the New York Times suggests senior military and intelligence officials were aware of what Hamas was planning more than a year ago, but ignored the warning signs. The revelation is piling more pressure on Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He was widely criticized at home for not publicly apologizing for the security failure that led to the Hamas offensive, something his security chiefs did in the immediate aftermath of the October attack. His ratings have plunged and he's faced repeated calls to step down. Israel has lost faith in the Prime Minister. We cannot allow ourselves to conduct an extended war with a Prime Minister that the public does not trust. Many analysts say Netanyahu's political future depends on how he handles the war on Gaza. So far, Israeli forces have killed more than 15,000 Palestinians, most of them women and children. Despite this, Netanyahu has reiterated that the objective in Gaza is to wipe out Hamas. We swore and I swore to eliminate Hamas. Nothing will stop us. We will continue this war until we achieve the three goals, to release all our abductees, to eliminate Hamas completely, and to ensure that Gaza will never again face such a threat. But these goals seem incompatible with any kind of push for a permanent ceasefire. The pause in hostilities in Gaza lasted just a week. Israel and its ally, the United States, were quick to blame Hamas. It's also important to understand why the pause came to an end. Um, it came to an end because of Hamas. Hamas reneged on commitments it made. While Hamas says Israel never intended to extend the ceasefire beyond seven days. The Zionist regime was preparing to start its genocide and war again on Gaza and its people. Yesterday, we were in meetings to extend the truce and we offered many proposals. The Israelis didn't want any of it. Qatar and the U.S. say negotiations are continuing for further humanitarian pauses and exchanges of captives. Israel says Hamas is still holding 137 people in Gaza. But with the Israeli government seemingly intent on making up for its own failures on October the 7th, is there political will for anything more than a temporary truce? Vincent Monahan for Inside Story. OK, let's bring in our guests in Tel Aviv. Oren Ziv is a journalist and photographer at Plus 972 magazine, an independent Israeli online news platform. In Sydney, we've got Anthony Lowenstein, author of The Palestine Laboratory, a book about Israel's arms and surveillance industry. And here in the Qatari capital is Omar Ashur, a professor of security and military studies at the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. Uh, and a warm welcome to you all. Anthony Lowenstein, I'd like to start with you. 
and this New York Times reporting that uh, a year beforehand, Israel acquired plans detailing an attack very similar to the one that actually took place. In fact, there were hints of just such an attack dating all the way back to 2016, but that a senior military intelligence officer rebuffed the plans because he believed Hamas simply didn't have the capacity. So it wasn't that they didn't know this was going to happen, it was that they didn't believe it was possible. I think that's correct. I mean, obviously, like any report at the moment, we have to take everything with a slight degree of salt. Not that the New York Times report might be wrong, but there's so much we still don't know. One of the things that I discovered in my reporting over the years before October 7th for my book, but certainly since, is that Israel, I think, over the years, like the US in many ways, has believed that technology, technology on its own, surveillance tech on its own, will keep them safe. It's belief somehow that 2.3 Palestinians in Gaza would be docile, would essentially accept their imprisonment. And yes, it does appear that Hamas was making plans. In fact, I've been reading reports that there were many Israelis on the Israeli side of the Gaza border who had seen Hamas militants rehearsing something and they were reporting back to that to the Israeli officials and they essentially were ignored, including many Israeli women and they were dismissed, I think, which sort of goes to the heart, I think, often of a very patriarchal society in many parts of the Israeli intelligence. And indeed, and in terms of the New York over... Times reporting, the analyst who signalled the greatest mm. sense of threat was also a woman. Yes, and I think from what I understand, this is based on my reporting before October 7, but in general, Israel, of course, prides itself on being gender balanced and very openly um, to women and people of colour and also, for that matter, of gay soldiers. But the truth is that when it comes to these kinds of issues, it seems that the messages were being ignored because they believed, wrongly and fatally, that somehow sophisticated repressive tech, which they then export around the world, would protect them, which, of course, believes in the end that Israel had this belief, and frankly, many Israelis, it wasn't just the intelligence, it was the Israeli public for years has believed that you could imprison people literally down the road from where they're living and somehow be safe, which, of course, is not true. So, in the end, this was less a, a failure of intelligence. The intelligence, in fact, looks pretty good, but more a failure of judgment. A failure of judgment, but also political hubris that Israel has believed for decades. I mean, it's the longest occupation in modern times at the West Bank and Gaza, of course, is under siege for close to 20 years by Egypt and Israel, that somehow people would accept that. Now, none of that justifies what Hamas did on October 7, by any means, but it certainly puts it in context that there was this deluded belief and also this idea somehow that you could have surveillance technology, repressive tech, drones, and also huge amounts of Palestinians who were um, being who were spying for Israel. We don't know the exact number in Gaza, including Hamas members, that somehow that would keep Israelis safe. Mm. And it's a delusion to believe that. Orange, let me bring you in on the way all of this is likely to be viewed in Israel, uh, because presumably this reporting will be repeated uh, in Israeli outlets. And what do you think the public will make of all this? Because, of course, they will know that something terrible went wrong. They will know that they were failed by the supposedly impregnable military intelligence apparatus. But this is incendiary, just to remind you of, of what has been reported here. The, this 40-page document called Jericho Wall included plans for a barrage of rockets at the outset of an att attack, drones to knock out the security cameras and automated machine guns along the border, and gunmen to pour into Israel en masse in paragliders, on motorcycles and on foot, all of which actually happened while the government was looking the other way. Yes, I think inside Israel it's an ongoing discussion. We've seen uh, a few reports in Israeli mainstream media of the intelligence, as Anthony mentioned, brought from the border, from the young female soldiers serving as observers on the border, and we're seeing a training of Hamas in the last months or year. And they even mentioned that at some point, uh, from what they saw, they understood the training has uh, ended uh, because they saw senior commanders that they haven't seen before coming to kind of a ending uh, ceremony or event. And they were passing the signals, the uh, 
uh, to more senior officers that uh, at some point even told them to stop harassing them and that this is imaginary. So I think in general, all the Israeli public across the political uh, spectrum, spectrum in Israel couldn't imagine uh, such an attack because people thought the army would have the intelligence. And as we see, it wasn't only a problem of intelligence, but also of understanding when this might happen, like having a specific intelligence on the weeks or months this could uh, take place. Now, people across the Israeli public are now busy with... Uh, is it we essentially the wrong moment for this sort of discourse to happen? I mean, people are... Society is so focused now on the captives, uh, it appears to be very much behind the war in Gaza, perhaps in, in search of retribution for what has happened or to make some sense of it. Is it, is it perhaps not yet the time to be discussing who it, is to blame or will this reporting start that debate? So this is debate, debate is, is happening specifically in the, the public that was protesting against Netanyahu and the overhaul uh, he, his government, his extreme government was promoting before October 7. And it seems that a lot of the public is feeling that Netanyahu will delay the war and extend the war because he knows, him and his government know that in the minute the war officially ends, of course, on the Israeli side, on the Gaza side, it will take years or decades to, to, to repair the damage. Uh, but on the Israeli side, if Netanyahu officially ends the war, protests will start in days, uh, immediately. Uh, and this is why many people fear here in Israel that Netanyahu will push on the war and would want an endless operation because he know, as you said, uh, the chief of staff, the head of Chin Bet and other officials already took responsibility and kind of, they didn't say it officially, but it's quite clear, they will resign when the war officially ends on the Israeli side. At the heart of this failure of judgment, this failure of intelligence or military interpretation, if you like, uh, is a determination apparently on the part of the military and of ministers in the government that Hamas simply lacked the capacity. It's been described as aspirational, totally imaginative, these plans that emerged, and crucially, that Hamas lacked the intention as well. Gaza was quiet, the problem seemed contained. How on earth was Hamas able so successfully to mask its ability and its intent and ensure that Israel continued to look the other way? So, uh, first, on the, on the Israeli side, I, I have to say, like, I'm not defending Unit uh, uh, 82,000 uh, 8, or, or, or anything like that, but... Um, That's the intelligence before. unit. Yeah, oh, the intelligence unit that did the assessment. Yeah, so uh, it, it happened. Be, uh, like, okay, so Pearl Harbor, the Americans fired the first shot. You know, they they, they sunk the the an assault Japanese submarine, and they were still surprised. How did Hamas oh, but, but, manage to essentially pull the wool over not, Tel Aviv's eyes? You can design. A, I can sit down here and design a perfect uh, textbook breach operation. And this is uh, coming to, uh, to to your to your question. So you can uh, well the, the breaching fundamentals. Hamas, can you still hear me? Yes, yes. Go on. We can hear you fine. Yeah. The uh, uh, the breaching fundamentals. Hamas executed it textbook. Like, uh, and I'm not talking. Uh, you know, I'm talking NATO grade. Like uh, Sostra, suppress, obscure, secure, reduce assault. They executed it like the textbook. Multi-domain operation. Um, um, with uh, 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 an, an airborne dimension, with a ground dimension, with a naval dimension, with a cyber dimension, which is not that much in the media, but I, I assume it will it will be it will appear, with an electronic warfare dimension and with an intelligence dimension. So it was it executed it as a perfect operation. If you so you can do this on paper, but then uh, to actually do it in reality, the amount of planning, training, logistics. Uh, men, um, uh, munitions, weapon systems. Then this is the issue, and, th and I think this is this was the the the, uh, the the main failure on the on the Israeli side is they they they, they saw this as a plan on paper, which is great. You can get a textbook on how to create a perfect ambush, and uh, and or, or in that case a, a, a large scale breaching operation, um, and then uh, you know and and then leave it on the paper. Um, but then, the, the, what, how Hamas did that 
I think that was a, a very, very long process of um, preparation. I think some of the documents that were captured goes go back to October uh, 2022, um, uh, the, the issuing of, uh, of orders uh, in terms of training. So we were talking about uh, a year, but probably there was another year of reaching this level. So we're talking probably about two years of preparation. Um, we're we're talking about because the the, the uh, it was a Hamas uh, uh, elite, for example, it was a regiment size formation. So we're talking about in the range of one thousand uh, fighters. Uh, those were the almost tier one NATO grade, um, uh, you know, fighters. Uh, if you looked at the rest behind them, uh, every single uh, mistake in the infantry book was done, so, uh, w w w was was committed in a way. So the, the level of training is very so I guess they focused all the resources on a particular uh, and they force. were they and were doing the all of that the they were doing all of that essentially in plain sight under the glare of inter in Israeli intelligence uh, and with politicians in Israel believing that Hamas wanted to get visas work visas to be able to work inside Israeli territory that Hamas did not want war uh, all of which. Oren Ziv leaves, as you were saying there, Prime Minister Netanyahu looking intensely vulnerable when the dust of war settles uh, here. To what extent do you think, and you were alluding to it there, that pursuing this war is for Prime Minister Netanyahu individually an attempt at putting off the inevitable, the inevitable moment uh, when public opinion turns against him, when he loses his job and possibly worse? First of all, it's important to mention that uh, Netanyahu and the more extreme uh, parts of his government, uh, until a week ago that the agreement uh, was signed, the hostages-prisoner hostages, hostages -prisoner deal was uh, signed exactly eight days ago, it seems that his government has gave up on the hostages and only the public pressure, the protest of the hostages' families and uh, tens of thousands of Israelis going to the street despite the, the sirens and the rockets that were fired uh, from time to time into center Israel, uh, the protests and the actions of uh, the families and their supporters led uh, this extreme government to agree to this deal because we heard Netanyahu saying a few times that eliminating Hamas, and we can talk about this uh, target later, and returning the hostages is equally important. And according to different reports, we've seen that already in the first days of the war, Hamas offered a deal of uh, the Israeli and the uh, Israeli children and women in exchange of the female Palestinian prisoner, 30-something Palestinian prisoners, and the Palestinian minors in Israeli prisons. And the government rejected this deal, open a war to satisfy the sense of revenge in the Israeli public and to show they're doing something. And after a month, on the Israeli media, Israeli media figures, and the government is claiming that the military efforts uh, allow this deal to happen in better conditions to Israel, which I disagree. So I think already we're seeing the, the public pressure helping here to achieve this deal and the government to to agree to ceasefire under the condition to renew the war. This is uh, something Smotrich and, and Ben Gvir and other ministers demanded that the ceasefire will not be too long, in their opinion. And I think now, slowly, we will see bigger parts of the public uh, going to protest directly against Netanyahu. We've already seen some of the people, some of the families of the victims uh, killed and murdered on October 7, protesting in front of the parliament. We've seen... Uh, small protests uh, in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. But I believe as, as this go on and more people in the public will realize that the, Netanyahu is really not setting goals uh, to this war, uh, and, you know, talking generally about eliminating Hamas, but not talking how to do it. And more importantly, not talking what will happen on the day after in Gaza. We've seen uh, uh, Yair Lapid, head of the opposition in Israel, publishing a document today uh, talking about the day after in Gaza, talking about international uh, interference there and other points. Uh, but more importantly, he's saying Netanyahu is not offering anything. And it's quite clear that under his extreme government, uh, no solution is acceptable mm. than maybe just uh, settling and staying in Gaza, as some of the ministers uh, and other right-wing uh, parliament members declared. Well, well, speaking of the day after and speaking of clear goals, I mean, one of them is to protect Israel from any future threat from Gaza. Anthony Lowenstein, 
bombing Gaza to the ground doesn't achieve that, does it? Uh, there need to be other ways, intelligence-driven uh, and led methods of protecting Israel from whatever threat it perceives to exist in Gaza beyond this war. I think that's right. And it's interesting, I note in the last 24 hours in Haaretz, the Israeli newspaper, there were comments that many of the Arab states who publicly have been very critical of Israel, and of course many of them in the last years have signed so-called normalisation deals with Israel, are saying privately, according to this report, that in fact they'd be happy for Hamas to be militarily defeated, assuming that's even possible, because they regard Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood as a threat to themselves in their own countries, wherever it may be in the Arab world. Look, ultimately, there is no military solution here. Israel has currently destroyed the northern part of Gaza. They seem to be moving into destroying the southern part. And, of course, that can only lead to one conclusion, which is that the idea ultimately is to make it uninhabitable for the vast majority of Palestinians there. And I see in the last 24 hours more reports in the Israeli press talking about how elements within Netanyahu's government, their vision, if you can call it that, is that, is to have as few Palestinians as possible left at the end of this. Doesn't mean they're going to kill all of them. It just means that to potentially find ways to remove them. Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon. Now, those nations at the moment have not accepted the idea of taking in Palestinians in sort of quasi-10 cities. That has not happened yet, despite the fact that I know Israel has attempted to bribe Egypt in huge amounts of money to take in lots of Palestinians in the Sinai. In fact, the report in the last 24 hours suggests Israel even imagined trying to get Palestinians out of Gaza via sea in the Mediterranean. Mm. I mean, kind of crazy ideas in a way. But that's the vision here, if you can call it that. There is no vision or beyond what the US is pushing, which is a Palestinian authority, which is deeply corrupt and unpopular mm. in the West Bank. I mean, there is no solution here without actually engaging Palestinians and Israelis in dialogue which so far no one serious seems to want to do. Indeed, outlandish ideas. Omar Ashur, what do you imagine represents victory for Israel in Gaza? When will enough be enough? Well, it's, uh, it's the, 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 the objective uh, for them, the declared as well, is to destroy, the, to destroy Hamas, basically, you know, militarily and politically. And if that objective is... Uh, there's a lot of civilians that are going to uh, be killed um, um, to, to get to that objective. Uh, they will consider them collateral damage. They will not really um, stop at that point unless there is like significant uh, political pressure uh, from the international community, from the US uh, specifically, and from others. Um, but uh, but the, the objective is uh, de de degrade and destroy Hamas. Uh, probably also will take over Gaza City. I don't know what it's it's unclear to me. Uh, the, the end game. I don't I don't think it's this... clear for the for the Israeli government. You know the the, the end game is uh, there's this, a big question this, mark this notion of, of taking over. This notion of mm -hmm. destroying Hamas, uh, and I'll throw this to you, Oren Ziv. This notion of destroying Hamas. Uh, it, it, I mean, on the face of it, looks fanciful in the sense that what struck me this week in the release of Palestinian prisoners on the occupied West Bank was the number of Hamas flags that were flying, the number of prisoners and prisoners' families who thanked, quote, the resistance, meaning Hamas, the idea that there are thousands of orphans uh, in Gaza now who will grow up with hatred, resentment and revenge in their hearts. The idea of getting rid of Hamas seems outright fanciful. Does that idea penetrate yes. at all in Israel? I think this idea of eliminating Hamas, at least in Gaza, is something that a vast majority of the Israeli public agree on, and it's because it's something that is promoted by uh, the media and uh, politicians from all uh, the political spectrum without really explaining that ideology It's not something that is so easy to, to eliminate, and specifically not mentioning that Israeli government, and specifically Benjamin Netanyahu, was strengthening Hamas through the years by because it was, mm. as, as they themselves said, it was good for them that Hamas is ruling uh, Gaza and gives them a reason not to to push further to, and it was an excuse not to, to promote any political or diplomatic solution and separate between the West Bank 
uh, and Hamas, as you said, uh, by releasing the prisoners, and I'm not sure this is done intentionally, of course, uh, Hamas is gaining a lot of power in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem. We're seeing uh, people thanking them, of course. Uh, I saw it personally being in East Jerusalem uh, uh, last week with the prisoners released. And as the civilian death toll escalates again, I want to ask you each very briefly what you think will make this stop. Anthony Lowenstein, will it be when Israel feels it has reasserted itself as a power to be feared? And that's what their intention is. The only thing that can stop this is America. It really is as simple as that. And, of course, at the moment, America has no intention of doing so. But the only power that can do so is Biden getting on the phone and stopping this. No other international power can do that. And I fear that that is not on the agenda at the moment, despite the need for it to happen, because America is still sending weapons to Israel as we speak, including bunker-busting bombs. So this is... America, on the one hand, talks about bringing some kind of reduction in civilian casualty. That's the public message, where privately they're sending many more weapons, which is what really matters in the end, tragically. Oren Ziv, will it be when Israeli public opinion decides that enough killing of civilians in Gaza is enough uh, and that this is one man's war and needs to end? A, the Israeli public is not really looking on what's happening in Gaza. The really mainstream media is not really bringing the images, the interviews, the, the things we see on your channel and other international channels. So the public is not really aware to the amount of uh, destruction and devastation in Gaza. Not yet, and unfortunately, perhaps. Not yet, perhaps. And, uh, and, we, and I think we, they're not we, aware of all the, the international uh, reactions to that. And unfortunately, I'm saying it uh, very sadly, I think for the Israeli public, with the sense of re revenge and sadness and with the, the statements for politicians, nothing will be enough. So I, I think, as Anthony said, this is about international pressure and not about no, the Israeli public. No space then for, it, for, for the suffering of Gazans. I understand. I'm sorry. We've got to move on. Omar Ashur, finally, last word to you. Will it be when Hamas gives up? It could be if uh, we don't know how much is left uh, in Hamas's arsenal of men, uh, weapons, and munitions, uh, and, and tunnels. We, but we know it's uh, Gaza is under siege, under double siege, one from around Gaza and one around the north, and probably there will be a third one around Gaza City. So we, we, it could be. But it, it also could be if, if uh, as my colleagues uh, said, international pressures on one end, uh, change in the public opinion on the other, that affects the decision makers. Uh, determination, but also the the, the casualties. Uh, the, you mm. know, Israel is very sensitive to casualties, and we're talking now about the fig figures that exceed 15 years of war in South Lebanon, 1985 mm. to 2000. Israel okay. lost uh, about 300 soldiers. Uh, now we're, we're north of uh, 360, um, and but counts. also casualties, okay. the wounded, uh, the POWs, the, the the missing, the 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 deserters, and so on. So the, these all these all are out of. Uh, the combat f uh, uh, area. OK, and, uh, Omar, we'll have to this... wrap it up there. Many thanks for your thoughts. Let me thank all of my guests for a spirited discussion. Oren Ziv in Tel Aviv, Anton Lowenstein in Sydney and Omar Ashur here in Doha. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on X. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Jonah Hull, and the whole team here, bye for now.